I've got a nice and pretty tricky divisibility problem to show you guys today. So we want to find all natural numbers a and n such that a to the n plus 1 plus 2 to the n plus 1 plus 1 is a multiple of a to the n plus 2 to the n plus 1. So in other words, a to the n plus 2 to the n plus 1 divides a to the n plus 1 plus 2 to the n plus 1 plus 1. We're going to do this by taking care of a lot of the like smaller cases at first. In other words, the values of n like 1 and 2 and the values of a like 1 and 2. And then make a big claim involving larger powers of a and n. So to start that off, let's see what happens if n equals 1. So that means that a squared plus 2 to the 1 plus 1, which is 4 plus 1, which is 5, is a multiple of, well, that's going to be a to the 1 plus 3. So that's going to be a plus 3. So now we just have to find out if a squared plus 5 is ever a multiple of a plus 3. Well, I want to notice that a squared minus 9 is always a multiple of a plus 3. That's because we can write a squared minus 9 as a plus 3 times a minus 3. And so that's going to be a multiple of a plus 3. But now if you take the difference of two multiples of a plus 3, you get a new multiple of a plus 3. So let's do just that. We'll take the difference of, well, which order should we do it in? Maybe we'll do this one minus this one. So that means 14 because we have a squared minus a squared and then 5 minus negative 9. So that's going to be 5 plus 9 is 14 is a multiple of a plus 3 because it's a combination of two multiples of a plus 3. But let's rewrite this uh, in terms of divisibility. So that means a plus 3 is a factor of 14. 14 has a fairly simple factorization into primes. So that tells us a plus 3 must come from the set 1, 2, 7, or 14. That's because those are all the factors of 14. But now notice we're assuming that a is a natural number. So that means a plus 3 cannot be 1 or 2 because a plus 3 is automatically bigger than or equal to 4. So that means that a plus 3 is either 7 or 14, which means that a is equal to, well, let's see, 4, or a is equal to 11. Well, now let's maybe check those two cases to see if they work. Let's recall that we're in the setup when n is equal to 1. And now let's plug a equals 4 and a equals 11 into these two configurations of a and make sure that we have this property. So notice for a equals 4, we have a squared plus 5, like we have over there. So that is 21. And then for this guy right here, well, we're going to have a plus 3, which is 7. But 21 is obviously a factor of 7. So now let's look about in this case. So if we plug a equals 11 in, well, we might as well just do it right there. We'll get 126. Then if we plug it in over there, we'll get 14. And then it's not too hard to check that 126 is a multiple of 14. So that means a equals 4 and a equals 11 are both solutions here, both paired with n equals 1. So let's write those down right here. So we have a equals 4, n equals 1, a equals 11, n equals 1. So those are our two pairs of solutions that we have so far. Okay, so let's maybe get rid of this and then we'll look at the case when n is equal to 2. So now we're ready to look at the case when n is equal to 2. Well, let's see what our condition says when n is equal to 2. That means we have a cubed plus 2 cubed plus 1. Well, that's going to be plus 9 is a multiple of, well, what do we get over here? We get a squared plus 5. But now we're going to use the same kind of trick. We're going to take an obvious multiple of a squared plus 5. And in this case, it'll be a cubed plus 5a is also a multiple of a squared plus 5. And then take this difference here. This time, we're going to do the bottom one minus the top one, though. So let's see what that leaves us with. 
we have 5a minus 9 is a multiple of a squared plus 5. But now the fact that 5a minus 9 is a multiple of a squared plus 5 tells us that 5a minus 9 must be bigger than or equal to a squared plus 5. We can move some things around here and see that that means that a squared minus 5a plus 14 must be less than or equal to zero. But now let's look at the discriminant of this quadratic. So that'll be negative five squared, which is 25, minus four times 14. But notice that is clearly less than zero. And so that tells us if we replace this inequality with an equality, there is never a solution. And that is a real solution, I should say. So we have that this is not equal to zero. By the intermediate value theorem, since that is never equal to zero, it must always be positive or negative. But then we can just pick a test point that's big enough, like maybe even a equals five, and we'll see that if we plug in a equals five, we get something that is positive. But that means that this expression is always positive, which means it's never less than or equal to zero, which means we've reached a contradiction. And what have we contradicted? We've contradicted this assumption up here, which was that a cubed plus nine was a multiple of a squared plus five. So that means we have the n equals one solutions. It's impossible to have an n equals two solution, which means we can assume that n is always bigger than or equal to three. So now we can start working through that. So far we've covered the case when n was equal to one, that gave us two solutions. We showed that there was no solution when n is equal to two. Now we're ready to tackle the case when n is bigger than or equal to three. I'm gonna leave you guys with a little bit of homework, and that is to check the subcases when a is equal to one and a is equal to two and show that those don't give any solutions. So that means we only need to consider the case when a is bigger than or equal to three. And so that's exactly what we're gonna do. So let's first suppose we have a solution. In other words, we want to suppose that a to the n plus one plus two to the n plus one plus one is a multiple of a to the n plus two to the n plus one. And we're actually gonna play the same game that we did for the n equals two case. And that is we're gonna take an obvious multiple of that guy over there and then take the difference. So notice that a times a to the n plus two to the n plus one is kind of an obvious multiple of a to the n plus two to the n plus one. Now let's take this difference so which order do we want to do it in? Maybe we'll do it from here to here. So notice the a to the n plus one will cancel and we'll be left with a times two to the n plus a minus two to the n plus one minus one. And so what we've just shown is that this is a multiple of a to the n plus two to the n plus one. But then the fact that it's a multiple of a to the n plus two to the n plus one means that it must be bigger than or equal to that number. So in other, in other words, we have a times two to the n plus a minus two to the n plus one minus one must be bigger than or equal to a to the n plus two to the n plus one. And now maybe what I'd like to do is to move things around in this inequality. So I'll move these guys from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And then simultaneously, I'll move this a to the n term to the other side of the inequality. So that's gonna leave me with a times two to the n minus a to the n plus a must be bigger than or equal to two to the n plus one plus two to the n plus two. So let's see if we can do some calculation on this. Well, notice I can factor out a two to the n here, and that'll leave me with two plus one left over after doing that factorization, which means here we have that this is equal to three times two to the n plus 
2. At this point, we are left with the following inequality. We've got this object over here underlined in pink must be bigger than or equal to this object over here underlined in pink. And what we want to show is that that is impossible. So let's maybe get rid of this and do just that. So far, we've had some motivation that the only two solutions are these two that have already been found. And so in order to finish off the proof of that, we need to show that this inequality is not possible. So we've got a times two to the n minus a to the n plus a is bigger than or equal to three times two to the n plus two. And let's recall that we're in the setup when a is bigger than or equal to three and n is bigger than or equal to three. And so what we will actually do is prove the following claim. And that is that f of x which is equal to 2 to the n times x minus x to the n plus x is less than or equal to 0 for all x bigger than or equal to 3. And I guess I should say n bigger than or equal to 3 as well. But if this function is always less than or equal to 0, well, then it can't be bigger than or equal to this thing, which is obviously positive for this value of a and n up here. So that means that this inequality would be impossible, and that would finish all of this off. Okay, so let's see maybe how we can do that. Well, let's start by just plugging in the value x equals 3. And then we'll show that this is decreasing. So if we see that it is less than or equal to 0 at 3, well then, if it's decreasing, it'll always be less than or equal to zero. So plugging in three, we see that we have three times two to the n minus three to the n plus three. But next I wanna notice that the largest value of this can occur when n is equal to three. So that means that this is always less than or equal to something that occurs when n is equal to three. But let's see what happens when n is equal to 3. We have 3 times 8, which is 24, minus 3 cubed, which is 27, plus 3. But all of that is equal to 0. So let's see what we've got. We have that f evaluated at 3 is always less than or equal to 0. Now let's show that this function is decreasing. And we'll do that with calculus. So notice that f prime of x is going to be equal to 2 to the n minus n times x to the n minus 1 plus 1. So notice x is our variable here, not n. So that's why we're just using the power rule. But again, this is going to take on its maximum value when n is equal to 3. So that means I can bring in this inequality where n is equal to 3 again and see that this is always less than or equal to eight minus three times nine plus one. But that's very, very clearly negative. So what that tells us is for all x bigger than or equal to three, f is decreasing. But since it started off less than or equal to zero and then was decreasing from there, that means it's always less than or equal to zero. But if this function is always less than or equal to zero for those values of x and n, that makes this inequality impossible. But if that inequality is impossible, then we have our only two solutions over here. And that's a good place to stop.